Hello and welcome again to the NPTEL course, The History of English Language and Literature. In today's session, we look at the rise of the novel in continuation with the various literary and non-literary events that had been dominating the 18th century. We began to see in one of the earlier sessions that the 18th century known as the long 18th century, also known as the Augustan age, the age of formalism and as the age of enlightenment had produced a number of new genres and given rise to a number of uh, new trends in literary and non-literary uh, writings. So this, uh, this session on the novel and this emergence of the novel also needs to be seen in continuation with the various set of events that were dominating the 18th century. We had noted multiple times that the 18th century was dominated by the enlightenment vision which was not restricted to uh, Britain but had swept across Europe and also certain other parts of the world. So, if we begin to look at how this uh, enlightenment vision had been shaped, uh, had been uh, shaping and defining the ways in which the uh, world began to be reconceived from the 18th century onwards, it is important to look at some of the early influences and some of these uh, things we have already taken a look at. We begin to notice that from the end of the 17th century onwards, a tendency towards a new kind of rationality and the significance of uh, reason and rationality in the understanding of all things connected with, uh, uh, with human uh, beings uh, were, uh, getting foreground and sig uh, were getting foregrounded significantly. So, accordingly we see that the late 17th century influences by Bacon, Descartes, Locke had given uh, rise to two different strands of uh, uh, progress and development. Uh, so, one was uh, primarily in the field of science which had then uh, branched out to various things uh, such as engineering, medicine, uh, uh, the aspects related to material goods, aspects related to health, uh, etcetera. And on the other hand, there was also a rising individualism, individualism at stake which had uh, led to the emergence of liberalism, the notions of freedom, uh, liberty, equality, etcetera and also to the rise of uh, capitalism and the new definitions of wealth. So, overall we, we also begin to notice that the uh, significance of the enlightenment vision in, was in contributing towards the progress or the pursuit of happiness of uh, mankind in general. So, we also find that uh, some of these uh, uh, major influences of these times we have already taken a look at. We have seen the how the writings of Bacon, uh, of Locke and also the works of Adam Smith uh, and also the various revolutions which were happening in uh, France, in uh, the United States, the uh, newer kinds of uh, things being invented in the scientific uh, fields, etc. How all of them were together contributing to the uh, various ways in which enlightenment was shaping and reshaping the uh, world in the 18th century. And uh, some of those uh, things we are yet to take a look at such as the industrial revolution, how all of these things uh, together culminated in the rise of the middle class and how it influenced the reading habits so on and so forth as well. So, um, when we discuss the rise of the novel, it is imperative to keep this vision in mind because we also begin to see how all the loose ends uh, come together and how they all eventually tie up to uh, the inevitable emergence of a newer, new kind of genre which also in uh, multiple ways enable the reading faculties of the uh, rising middle class. So, uh, when we look at the uh, reflection of uh, the enlightenment in the literary trends, uh, we also began to notice that the literature of the enlightenment period could be divided into three different periods. When we talk about the literary output of the enlightenment period, we also began to notice that this could be broadly divided into three different periods and some of which we have already taken a look at. So, accordingly we have noticed the set of events that had led to the glorious revolution of 1688-89 and also the uh, resulting literary tendencies which had led to the age of uh, Pope in the 1730s and uh, mostly the early 1700s onwards. Uh, we had taken a look at the works of Alexander Pope of Daniel Defoe and Jonathan Swift. We had also noticed how these two writers primarily had uh, uh, laid the foundations of a new kind of writing which was also uh, to become the most dominant uh, form, the most dominant genre in the uh, coming decades. So, in the uh, second phase of this enlightenment period uh, of the long 18th century, 
In the second phase of this Enlightenment uh, literature, we noticed that this literature was primarily produced in the 40s and 50s of the 18th century. This also uh, characterizes the major uh, fundamentals of uh, the novel writing in English literature and all of these writers we are yet to take a look at. So, but we have already taken a look at the last decades of 18th century primarily for reasons of uh, um, uh, the division of convenience. So, in the last decades it was dominated by writers such as William Gottsmith, uh, William uh, by writers such as William Goldsmith uh, of whom we have already taken a look at and in both these uh, ages from the mid uh, 18th century towards the end of the 18th century, uh, we notice that these this was the period which uh, primarily laid the foundations of the emergence of uh, novel as a proper genre. And uh, uh, for reasons of uh, uh, classification and convenience, uh, we have already taken a look at the other uh, major genres of this period. And now we resort to take a look at only the no novel form and how it emerged in the uh, 18th century. We also begin to notice that just like uh, in many other ages, there are a lot of overlaps in terms of uh, the ages. We also find that the uh, birth of the novel and the emergence of the novel is spread across all these different literary ages which we have already taken a look at in terms of the age of Pope and also uh, as the age of uh, Johnson. Uh, we notice that it is very difficult to uh, uh, particularly uh, attach one name to the rise of the novel, to the age of the novel because it spread across the 18th century in varying degrees and through, uh, uh, through varying influential uh, forces. When one talks about the beginnings of the novel or the origins of the novel, it is very difficult to uh, highlight a particular date or a text or uh, an, exact, uh, uh, an exact form through which it evolved. So, many of these things are much disputed and uh, a lot of works have already come out uh, arguing and debating about the different possibilities of novel emerging at different points of time. However, we need to uh, uh, we need to also keep in mind the fact that there is a general consensus about novel emerging in the 18th century and also certain uh, particular authors laying the foundations of this uh, new genre of the 18th century. We also had noticed in one of the earlier sessions that this genre since it did not have any literary baggage like poetry or other kinds of writing, it was easy to experiment and the form was also uh, more flexible for the writers to, uh, to uh, use it in uh, many different forms. There was no model like the classical model available for imitation. Accordingly, there was a very little pronouncement of judgment of the uh, novels which were coming out especially during the earlier times. And uh, Hudson talks about a novel in a particular way when he begins to identify certain kinds of writings which could also be called as earlier forms of novel. He talks about them as the particular kind of prose fiction which we now call the novel. So, accordingly, uh, even while we agree that novel is the greatest achievement of the 18th century, we begin addressing this uh, question by taking a look at some of the earlier works which uh, could be uh, broadly classified under the term prose fiction. It is important to keep in mind that when we talk about prose fiction before novel, it is uh, mostly a very uh, technical uh, nomenclature thing that we are talking about because uh, a novel as per its definitions, uh, it had uh, not begun to emerge until the end of the 18th century and it is also important to highlight right at the outset that uh, Samuel Richardson is considered as a father of English novel. So, in that sense, when we talk about the predecessors, we are not talking about early novelists, but we are talking about certain set of uh, writers and certain set of writings who had, uh, who and which had paved the way towards the emergence of novel proper. There is a general consensus that uh, a particular kind of prose fiction had begun to emerge even from the age of uh, Shakespeare because he was one of the master storytellers and though it was in verse, a certain kind of uh, uh, background for uh, storytelling was already being laid from the time of uh, Shakespeare onwards and some of his, uh, uh, in most of his uh, uh, plays we also noticed that uh, much of it was in uh, prose in order to cater to the interests of the common public. Soon after that we had a couple of works which uh, were then described as prose fiction and now also seen as a forerunners of the novel proper. Uh, there were Sydney's Arcadia and a couple of prose romances written by Lodge and Green. We also find a did didactic kind of prose fiction uh, being produced by Thomas Moore, uh, Lilly and uh, Bacon. Though they were not really seen as a different kind of writing or the uh, or as uh, markers of a newer uh, form of genre, 
uh, on hindsight in the 18th century they were all looking uh, uh, they were all uh, seeming to look like uh, forerunners of uh, novel so there were also certain realist and picaresque productions picaresque uh, uh, prose uh, fiction uh, writings produced by nash around the same time owing to the uh, compelling influences from france especially in literary taste and also in terms of fashion and in terms of the other cultural trends of the times we find a certain kind of heroic romance getting increasingly imitated from the uh, 16th century onwards and also the sort of writing getting dominated in the 17th century uh, but this was uh, vehemently critiqued as uh, promoting a, a, a form of a sham chivalry a sham pastoralism and a pseudo form of history and we also find that this did not gain much popularity since that was also the time when the english uh, writers and the english writings were uh, trying to uh, tr trying to focus more on the native influences than on the borrowed literary traditions and at this point it's also worthwhile to note that uh, afra bens or uh, orunuko which had uh, which was published in 1688 was also a terrible reaction uh, against the prolixity and absolute unreality of the earlier prose fiction so in that sense it's also important to keep in mind that the earlier forms of uh, uh, fiction uh, the earlier forms of prose fiction were uh, mostly unrealistic and not really related to real life in any way from the end of the 17th century and early 18th century onwards we also find a certain uh, form of writing later which has come to known as uh, character writing promoted by addison and steele through their periodical essays and john bunyan's use of fiction as allegory in his work pilgrim's process in his work pilgrim's progress was also seen as a significant contribution to the uh, emergence of the novel and around this time we also noticed that there was an increasing popularity for biography and many were writing biographies and it was also getting consumed in uh, large numbers so in a certain way when we talk about the craft and technique of writing many historians and literary critics also feel that it was easy to carry over the methods from the historical narrative to these uh, uh, fictitious narratives of uh, the uh, novel form when we talk about daniel defoe and his works it's also difficult to resist the argument whether he is one of the first novel writers or not uh, but however his uh, place in the evolution of fiction remains undisputed and since he had rejected the conventions of uh, prose romance which had uh, which was uh, prevalent then and also had adopted the manner of the man tone of actual biography uh one can say that he had come very near to the genuine novel or the novel proper of the 18th century but however hudson is of the opinion that he just missed his way because of the way in which novel later emerged as a more genuine and a more proper form and uh, according to hudson uh, he argues that uh, defoe's tales which originally he intended to be uh, consumed as a proper biographies rather than fiction uh, they were far removed from normal life and character and also had dealt with a uh, strange adventure and uh, and crimes and romances so uh, his work could be at best seen as a uh, as a work of fantasy as a work of romance rather than as a novel so there are also uh, various critics who are of the opinion that defoe could be considered as one of the earliest uh, novel writers and needs to be considered as the founding father of the novel form in english uh, however uh, there are multiple uh, debates and varying opinions about this by the mid 18th century and towards the uh, end of the 18th century it would be possible to state that though there were many kinds of prose fiction available for popular consumption 18th century was yet to witness a novel of contemporary social and domestic life and uh, and this uh, this sort of a uh, uh, gap was filled by samuel richardson's uh, pamela richardson incidentally as we uh, noted is also considered as the father of the modern uh, novel and his novel pamela was quite different from the earlier prose romances in the uh, in the sense that it tried to reflect the uh, doings of ordinary people in a familiar setting and not focused on a distant uh, a land of fantasy or a distant land of adventure we shall come back to talk about uh, samuel richardson and pamela uh, in, in a short while and uh, meanwhile it's very important to locate the various factors which led to the rise of the novel in the 18th century uh, it's important to uh, highlight the fact that the rise of the novel in the 18th century coincided with the rise of the middle classes and also printing uh, had contributed enormously to the 
uh, to the consolidation of this new uh, form of uh, writing. And uh, alongside printing the new forms of distribution of the printed material, the growth of literacy in England, all of this had contributed much to the new form of uh, writing. And also it is uh, uh, noticeable that the uh, literacy and the dissemination of writing material was also cutting across a class and gender, no longer limited to the aristocratic class or to uh, learned men alone. And around this time, we also see a significant change in the way the authors and the writers uh, begin to be perceived. In a later, in an earlier, uh, uh, in, in the early ages, we noticed that the writers were heavily dependent on the patronage of the wealthy nobles. But around this time, the writer's popularity and the writer's claim to fame or uh, claim to success also depends heavily on the uh, on the sales of books. So, in a certain we also see that a middle class readership which was growing steadily also contribute to a certain kind of a market for literary goods. So, we begin to see that the newer forms of uh, uh, economics and the newer trends in our uh, market were also influencing the ways in which literary works were getting produced, disseminated and also how uh, particular literary works commanded and uh, led to particular uh, forms of success. So, during this time, uh, we also find the emergence of the author as a more independent figure, no longer dependent on the state or on particular individuals. It is uh, again not to say that uh, the novel form was completely free from criticism. There were a lot of objections uh, against the rise of this new form. It was identified with the French romance and hence many thinkers of those times felt that this needs to be rejected vehemently since it did not contribute much to the development of the native uh, literary traditions. It was also derided as a sensationalist import and it was uh, said to corrupt the uh, morals of the, uh, of the youth in England. And it was also considered antithetical to the English uh, values. So, because of this perhaps at least in the earlier time there existed a certain uh, selective legitimation of novels that displayed non-romantic uh, features. In terms of the uh, novels that dominated the 18th century, it is important to note that uh, the predominant factors which characterized most of the no uh, novels of the early period were realism and individual consciousness and uh, keeping in tune with the spirit of the enlightenment and the spirit of the new forms of rational thinking, we also find that the experience of the individual had was given more weightage than any other uh, element of uh, um, fantasy or any other kind of spectacle. So, we also find the emergence of middle class uh, protagonists and uh, the protagonist or the hero is no longer a uh, uh, a, a famous person or even uh, not a replica of uh, one of the earlier heroes, but he could be just an ordinary man who had a very middle class origin. And we need to talk a little more about the aspect of realism. Uh, the realist novel was perhaps the most uh, most uh, common and the most uh, fundamental kind of novel that emerged because it was seen as uh, being synonymous with uh, veracity. It had more descriptive elements and hence it was closer to real life. There was also a photographic attention to uh, detail uh, given by most of the authors. They also rejected the, uh, the aspects of fa fabulous imaginings and idealism of the romances. Altogether, there was a denial of fictionality and it was get moving closer to real life in multiple ways. So, in that sense it also uh, required a certain probability in character setting and event. Uh, accordingly, the events were also set in a specific land and not in, a, in a, any vague imaginary land. We also find that the uh, writers of this uh, time rejecting the traditional plots in favor of uh, something which was uh, closer to a uh, real life setting. One of the later critics of a uh, novel, he has uh, compiled these three major elements uh, as being quite uh, foundational and significant to the uh, to the aspect of novel contemporaneity believability and familiarity so even today if we begin to distinguish novel from other forms of writing we begin to know that these are some of the fundamental aspects that uh, are going to play a significant role in the uh, classification and in the distinction Perhaps one of the most important uh, changes during this time was the way in which it was uh, becoming possible to build a literary career upon this new genre. It was uh, quite unlike any other kind of uh, uh, genre which was prevalent in England and also we begin to note that this genre stayed on for quite a while and it also brought a lot of success, fame and money to whoever was willing to write for the 
uh, for the for the common uh, public. So we also see a, a transition from the dependent uh, writer to an independent writer who could also in many ways dictate uh, his own uh, life and uh, writing destiny by by catering to the interests of the common man. So if we uh, try to sum up the uh, rise of the novel in the 18th century, we begin to notice that all of these influences had uh, begun to shape from the 16th and 17th century onwards. And in the 18th century, due to several reasons including uh, the uh, effects that we had discussed much earlier about uh, Puritanism, about the, evolve, uh, about the evolution of uh, Methodism, the various forms of philosophical rationalism, the influence of uh, French and Italian books and all of these things together contributing to the emergence and rise of the novel. We also find that certain, uh, certain newer forms of writing such as the, the dissemination of the newspaper or the, or the expansion of the reading public also contributing much to this uh, newer much to this new phenomenon known as the novel. It is now time for us to take a look at who the early major novelists were. So I have listed uh, some of the major novelists of the 18th uh, century and these are also the list of uh, novelists who find their place in most of the canonical texts as the founding fathers of uh, uh, early English novel. Daniel Defoe, we have already taken a look at his uh, life and his works and we have also seen how his work was quite different from that of uh, Jonathan Swift and how in multiple ways it is seen as a prototype of the novel rather than uh, a, a, we have also seen how Defoe's tales were seen more like a prototype of the novel rather than the novel form in proper. Then we have Samuel Richardson who is considered as a founding father of uh, the English uh, literary novel. Henry Fielding, Lawrence Stern and Henry Mackenzie. Out of these writers, Richardson, uh, Fielding and Stern are of supreme importance to our understanding of the English novel. However, in course of a discussion, we should also be taking a look at some of the other writers also who had contributed to this field. If we try to understand the writings of these various uh, writers in a very broad sense, it is important to note that. Um, Swift, one of the earlier writers uh, who wrote more of an experimental form of uh, novel. If we begin to look at the, uh, the early influences that these writers had on this particular genre, it is important to take a look at the various ways in which they experimented and tried to come up with different forms of novel. So here we also uh, notice that Jonathan Swift who had primarily produced a few satires. Uh, he can also be considered as one of the forerunners of the novels, but uh, there's, there are a lot of debates about where he, whether he could be included as one of the major novelists or not. Uh, we also have uh, as noted Samuel Richardson who produced mostly uh, bourgeois and sentimental novels. Uh, we have Daniel Defoe who is said to have produced the first realist proto novel, Henry Fielding with the first comic no novel and Lauren Stern with the first experimental novel. Around this time we also find that since most of these early writers were experimenting in this newer form of writing, it was very difficult to uh, form any kind of principle or any uh, particular way of writing and say that this constitutes a novel and this does not. So this also had led to a lot of uh, disputes for uh, at least for a few decades from the 18th century onwards to in order to exactly uh, try and understand what constituted the, uh, the novel form of writing and what did not. And since here we are not, uh, since we are not here to pronounce any kind of judgment on the early kinds of writings, it would be safe to assume that all of them had played uh, uh, almost an equal role in laying the foundations of this genre in the 18th century. So here if we try to take a look at the different types of novel which was prevalent in the 18th century, it is important to note that uh, Robinson Crusoe's it is important to note that Defoe's Robinson Crusoe could be considered as a realist novel, Richardson's uh, Pamela as an epistolary novel which is a novel in the form of letters, Swift's Gulliver's Travels as a philosophic and satiric novel, Fielding's uh, Tom Jones as an epic novel, Tristram Shandy by Stern as an experimental novel and uh, Robinson Crusoe and Pamela also uh, they could be classified as uh, Bildung's Roman which is something that we shall come back to take a look at in one of the later sessions. In, in today's session we uh, in terms of the individuals we particularly focus on Samuel Richardson who lived from six, 1689 till 1761. 
He was a prosperous and a well-known printer in London, but he had worked up his way from poverty and that also had given him a lot of life experiences to begin with. Uh, he, however, realized his vocation for writing only at the age of 50. There is no known evidence of him having produced any literary work before this uh, period. Uh, what became a turning point in, in Richardson's uh, career was uh, was the uh, was at a time when two of his publisher friends contacted him to with a request to prepare a little volume of letters in a common style for country readers who were unable to indict for themselves. Uh, we also noted in one of the earlier sessions that letter writing was also a favorite pastime and art. So. Mm, since many country readers, the readers who were uh, uh, residing mostly in the non-urban areas were not very well versed in the art of writing, it was seen as a good, uh, it was seen as a uh, good proposition to come up with a series of sample letters for them to consume. So, Richardson was uh, quite excited by this uh, prospect and he set out to uh, do this particular thing. And he also thought that it would be interesting to strand, uh, to string all these uh, letters in a common, uh, with a common thread. So he decided to base his, uh, base uh, this entire set of letters upon a true story that he had heard uh, uh, many years before. So this, in fact, was quite a turning point in the way in which this uh, uh, this series of letters were going to be composed, and it was later noted about this work that came out from this original intention. While he set out to compose this set of letters, he decided that it would be quite appropriate if it is uh, strung together with a common thread. So he did, decided to base uh, these set of letters upon a true story that he had heard many years before. And he also wanted to make it more accessible to the common public and not to make it too ornamented or too uh, declamatory. In his own words, he uh, wanted to come up with uh, such a book which, if written in an easy and natural manner, suitable to the simplicity of it, might possibly introduce a new species of writing, turn young people into a course of reading different from the pomp and parade of romance writing and tend to promote the cause of religion and virtue. So here we see that the original intention of Samuel Richardson's uh, work, this series of letters, was to promote a sense of uh, uh, religion, a sense of virtue and also to correct the young uh, people from being corrupted by the uh, evil influences of the romance writings which were prevalent during those times. And the resultant work was not just a series of letters but the, uh, but the novel Pamela which had an alternate title or virtue rewarded. So this was published in 1740 and instead of becoming a series of letters for the readers from the countryside, it, uh, it rose to fame as the first novel and that to an epistolary novel, a novel written in the form of letters or in the form of journal entries. So what originally began as a project of uh, ready letter writing, it became the, it became the first novel, a pro it became the first proper novel in English language. When we talk about the plot of Pamela, it includes the uh, story of a young girl uh, who was a lady's uh, maid in waiting and um, after the death of her mistress, she is uh, forced to resist the advances of the libertine uh, son of her mistress who eventually is, uh, uh, who eventually is quite impressed by the virtue of uh, uh, this young woman Pamela and he also decides to re uh, reward her through marriage. So this young girl whom he was pursuing uh, eventually becomes his wife. So the structure of the, uh, the the structure of the novel is in such a way that all these uh, letters or the journal entries are by the uh, heroine, as uh, we can see here in the title itself, Pamela or Virtue Rewarded, in a series of familiar letters from a beautiful young damsel to her parents. So as uh, uh, as uh, Richardson's original intention was to give some kind of a moral teaching to the young men and women of uh, uh, England, he also intended this as a as a contact book. So, in a certain way, it even earned um, many praises from the church uh, pulpit uh, itself. But at the same time, it was also seen as quite uh, hypocritical. But at the same time, it was also seen as quite hypocritical for various reasons. And one of the most important reasons, uh, which also was a uh, 
uh, source of uh, m uh, much discomfort for the readers of uh, those times and as well as the readers of the later times was that it in some form or the other underscored the role distinctions uh, between uh, sexes. So, we find that this uh, novel in certain way it, uh, it inaugurated this uh, common pattern of the dominant male as the provider and master and the female as the uh, victim preserving her virtue until submitting to what could be considered as affection and the inevitability of the man's dominance. So, in, uh, in a certain way it is also said to have inaugurated a discourse on sexual roles in, in multiple ways it is also said to have inaugurated a certain uh, uh, particular stereotypical discourse on uh, sexual roles. Richardson's uh, Pamela was primarily written as a moral code. It was we also uh, also find the uh, predominance of a moral tone throughout the novel, and uh, but at the same time, in spite of the many limitations that the novel could have uh, possessed, it's important to give it the elements uh, since it uh, is one of the earliest works and since. Uh, Richardson not being a trained writer or Richardson uh, ha having uh, not conceived this originally as a, a form of novel the techniques and craft of which were yet unknown. It is very important to understand and appreciate the various efforts which were uh, put into the conception of this work and also to see the various criticisms in the uh, light of the times. As Pamela was a huge sensational hit and success it also prompted Richardson to uh, come up with a few more primarily Clarissa or the adventures of a young lady this also was uh, commonly titled as Clarissa Harlow. This was uh, uh, this came out in 1747-48 this work is considered as Richardson's um, masterpiece and he also earned a lot of uh, reputation across Europe for this work. This was also in the form of an epistolary uh, novel it was in the form of letters there are four major letter writers in this work Clarissa Harlow. Uh, unlike uh, in uh, Pamela where the only uh, character who was writing letters was Pamela herself. And Clarissa was also important in uh, having produced a, a newer kind of character study in the character of a uh, scoundrel character named uh, Lovelace. He also became a prototype for many uh, many similar characters in the 18th century which were who were also part of uh, many other novels. Uh, however, the criticisms were also many given that the novel was still in the form of infancy. Uh, Clarissa was critiqued vehemently for the extremely long and dragging narratives. There was a series of endless repetition, uh, masses of unimportant detail and the structure altogether was uh, quite clumsy and not uh, coherently put together. Um, and this uh, novel since this was written in the form of a series of letters which pass among characters. Uh, Hudson also uh, opines that it leaves us with a disturbing sense of the extreme artificiality of the whole fabrication. Nevertheless, many critics also felt that his genius was rather feminine rather than masculine uh, primarily because he had an attention to details they were in finite details in his uh, writings. He also paid attention to small and trivial things which were seen as uh, more of a feminine character than a masculine character then. And um, also because uh, perhaps his female characters were uh, uh, better portrayed than his male characters and also if we notice uh, being the earliest novel it was quite uh, it, it was quite um, uh, unlikely of those times to have a, a female protagonist and also have a character a full uh, a fully developed female character uh, during the 18th century. He also produced another novel Sir Charles Grandison in 1753. This along with the other novels that he produced was mostly severely published and we also uh, uh, we also get to know from history that it was quite uh, popular and people used to wait for the next uh, series uh, to be written and published. So, one of the original intentions of uh, Richardson in writing the novel was to purify the society and manners of those times. He thought that through this he could even bring in a moral revival. But nevertheless, it is uh, just, uh, just another irony that uh, the uh, Richardson's name is more associated with the novel which is perhaps the most secular form of uh, uh, writing that 18th century produced. As we begin to wrap up this lecture, it is very important to uh, leave a note about the epistolary novel. 
the epistolary novel was perhaps the most uh, uh, common kind of uh, novel that the 18th century produced. Though it was a very novel form, it caught the fancy of the, uh, uh, of the reading public. Uh, primarily because it uh, sought to give several correspondents the opportunity to set forth a point of view. So, this multiplicity also created the impression of uh, uh, diversity in the narrative. This was uh, quite unlike the other forms of uh, writings where only a single point of view could uh, be uh, disseminated. And we also find that in spite of these uh, multiple uh, points of view and the multiple uh, characters who were allowed to, uh, allowed to speak and write, we also find that one character dominates and that also had brought in uh, some coherence and structure to the uh, form of the novel. And uh, in, in, in one of uh, Richardson's work, he also went an extra mile to accommodate the views and suggestions of the readers also. So, in that sense, it was also an interactive form. Uh, given that uh, the, it was also an interactive form in the 18th century. And this epistolary uh, uh, form of writing uh, novels, it need, we cannot say that uh, Samuel Richardson inaugurated this form because we also uh, have uh, Fra Ben's work published in 1683 titled Love Letters Between a Nobleman and His Sister. But for various technical reasons, it is not seen as a novel proper just like Defoe's works are not. And uh, Richardson gets the credit for uh, publishing the first English novel and the first epistolary uh, novel in the 18th century. Having noticed and highlighted how Richardson produced the first novel in the 18th century, it also uh, prompts us to take a look at the other major writers of the period who laid the foundations to this particular genre. And in the next session, we shall be uh, continuing to look at the rise of the novel and how various novelists and the various uh, writings of those uh, times in uh, many ways cemented the possibility of this genre becoming the most popular genre in the coming uh, decades and centuries. That is all we have for today's lecture. Thank you for listening and we look forward to seeing you in the next session.